I am Zubin Mehta, music director of the New York Philharmonic and Israel Philharmonic Orchestras. I am also a Zoroastrian. Most people know us as fire worshippers. One of the world's great religions, Zoroastrianism is also one of the least known. I make music all over the world and in every biography they mention my religion. Most of the time I find myself at a loss for words explaining it. Of course, I know the usual cliches that make up the Zoroastrian trinity. Good thoughts, good words and good deeds. But more than that I don't know. And the other 120,000 like me don't know much more either. Isn't it time the world knew a little more about us? Bombay, and this is a Naujot ceremony I myself went through when I was nine years old. Just like these three children, I also had to learn a book this thick in an ancient language I didn't understand. These are my people, the Parsis of India, followers of Zoroastrianism, the oldest surviving revealed religion in the world. But after 37 years, I still don't know too much about it, so I've come back to find out if it has any sort of relevance in my life today. I was literally brought up under the Zoroastrian Trinity, our version of the Ten Commandments. You know, as a boy at home, my parents literally drummed it into me. The concept of good words, good thoughts and good deeds. Manashni, Gavashni, Kunashni. These are concepts I try to live by automatically. But I can have wisdom. I mean, I don't have to wear this. These symbols, these garments. Oh yes, you should. If you want to be a better Zoroastrian, if you want to experience the religion fully, then you should wear them. The Sutra and Kusti will be your guide and protector against the forces of evil. In them are symbolized many elements of the religion. The Sutra is white to represent the purity of thought. 
In front of the sudra, there's a little pocket in which your good deeds are stored. The kushti is made of fine lamb's wool. It's wound three times around your waist to remind you that you produce good thoughts, good words, good deeds all the time. The kushti is tied with a reef knot in the front and a reef knot at the back. The reef knot is a perfect knot to symbolize the joining of the physical and the spiritual. You must go to the source, in our case the Garthas, the hymns of the Prophet himself. From them comes everything we believe in. He asked me to go with him on a journey to find out about my ancestral religion. It would be like traveling on wings of fire. It was an offer I could not refuse. I told the priest that I wanted to go to the town of Nausari my ancestral home, which I had never seen. Four thousand years before Christ, the Iranians and Indians belonged to the same group of people, known as the Aryans, from which the name Iran is derived. Eventually, around 3000 BC, they separated some drifting to the east, to India, and some to Iran. It was here, near the Aral Sea, where Zarathustra is believed to have been born. Survival was hard for these nomads, who perceived struggle as an essential factor of life. These Indo-Iranians regarded the many elements of nature as gods, and therefore they worshipped such things as fire and water. They made many sacrifices to these gods, in order to gain some control over their destinies. However, the terror of marauding barbarians played havoc with their lives. Zarathustra. According to legend, he was the only child who laughed when he was born instead of crying. The Garthas, comparable to the Psalms in the Judeo-Christian religions, say, those who are made to cry have seen mortality as their end, and those who have laughed have seen their own righteousness. This laughter seemed to be the first sign of a divine power watching over the child. Zarathustra. As Zarathustra grew into his late teens, the doubts about his family's religion and their traditions became so totally unacceptable that he decided to look for better answers elsewhere. The radical step of leaving family and home naturally was an emotional upheaval and perhaps even frightening. But the young man knew that it was necessary. And so painfully, and with the reluctant blessings of his family, he left in his search for truth. For ten years, 
Zarathustra renounced the world he knew. He was determined to pursue his ever-deepening hunger for Asha, the truth. He traveled over the years in this solitary quest, and, as legend has it, he didn't find his answers. Just as it was for the many prophets who came after him, Zarathustra was confronted with many temptations. It was his unique strength and determination that enabled him to stay on his course. Finally, Ariman, Satan himself, appeared, totally frustrated, and Zarathustra exploded in a fit of anger. Spitamas and of the Aryans. I am called Zarathustra. I bring the law of God and the knowledge of his laws. I bring the true worship and devotion of God. I come to announce the judgment of God and to issue warning of the day of God's judgment and man's final resurrection. I am the prophet of God guardian of his creation. My God is Abura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom. In the following ten more years of his traveling the land, he succeeded in gaining just one follower, just one person who could accept his revelations, his cousin, Mediamanga. Where can I go? To what land can I flee? I am excluded from my family and my friends. I am powerless. I have no followers. The wicked are still admired by all for their wealth and power. How can I please you, O oh Lord? Tell me, Master. Tell me you will give me the support which a friend should give to a friend. Like Confucius after him, Zarathustra searched his country for a king who would accept his teachings, a patron who would support him. Until finally, in the twelfth year of his quest, the most important event in the history of Zoroastrianism took place. I've asked you here since you are said to be the wisest of the followers of our religion. I hope you'll prove to be so. I wish you to question this priest for me, to test the strength of the message he says he brings us. Ask him any questions you like. You say that you are a priest. Is that of your religion or ours? I was chosen from your religion by Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom, to waken men from the darkness in which they have been slumbering. You dare say our established religion is one of darkness? It is, because any religion that worships evil gods as much as good ones is blind to the bright light of truth. We only worship the gods of evil to appease them. How else can their harmful influence be kept away from us? How else can evil be controlled? You cannot control it if you do not understand the true nature of this world. There are two spirits in it, one of good and one of evil. So, there are two gods now. 
I thought there was only one. There is only one God, Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom. And did he create this world on his own? Yes, he created everything. So he created evil too, this good and righteous God you ask us to worship? He did not. I did not say... Clearly he did. If he created everything, then he must have created evil too. What a cruel, unthinking tyrant this God of his must be. He is not cruel or unthinking. I will not have my God spoken of in such a way. Then explain to me. Convince me why they are wrong. I need a lighted torch and a goblet. Get them for him. The goblet makes a shadow on the table. The shadow is like evil. It has no source. It is entirely negative. But surely the source of the shadow is the light. How can it be? It is its opposite. But the shadow cannot exist without the light. It is entirely dependent on it. This is mere wordplay. I don't think so. Go on. If you look, you will see the shadow seems attached to the goblet, an inseparable part of it, just as evil often seems to have a vice-like grip on all our lives. So how do we loosen that grip? You can't be parted from your own shadow. You can if you choose to follow the good path, which leads us always closer to the light, which is God's wisdom. You see, the shadow now becomes separated from the cup. It has lost its hold on it. And as we move still closer to God, the shadow becomes even weaker and more powerless, until at last we are able to see it for what it is, a mere illusion, and itself lacking the strength to attack us. If all mankind chose to further the truth, that evil, like darkness, would be vanquished. Indeed, when we reach that stage, evil will finally be defeated in the world, and death and destruction will be no more. Death is not evil. Death is a part of life itself. We have always believed that, yes. If we gave him long enough, he would convince us black was right. Of course, death is not evil. Then if you were to die now, this instant, would you regard it as an act of goodness, the act of a kind and loving God? Go on. Answer him. It is a foolish question. It is not. Death in our world is inevitable, for without it, divine justice could not take place. Death is the separation of the physical body from its spiritual counterparts, the soul and the spirit. Clearly, that which destroys life is evil. One thing I notice. There's no talk of punishment. Are you not afraid of your God? Why should I be? He is my friend. More like a father to me. My lord, I can put up with this no longer. This is no religion. This is no god at all. Why do you say that? Because one can do whatever one likes in this faith. What if we were to lead wicked lives? One will be punished in the hereafter. <laughs> After death, all our souls will be judged at the bridge of the separator, which for the virtuous is as wide as any road. But for the wrongdoer, is as narrow as the blade of the sharpest sword. Those who have done more bad than good will fall into the abode of gloom and darkness below. While those who have done more good than bad will rise up to the abode of joy and light. And so we're encouraged to lead good lives. We are. Called your master. I find much that is beautiful and wise in your religion. Then I beg you to be true to your heart and accept the message of Ahura Mazda. No, my lord. You say no. Cannot. You dare to tell me what I can and cannot do? My lord, if you accept this religion, it is not you alone who will accept it, but your people who will have to accept it too. He's right. This is not just a personal decision. I must have time to think. I shall need to talk further with you. Whenever you wish it. It was ordained that King Vishtaspa would be the person who would deliver Mazda's message to mankind. However, some of the court advisors felt their own positions threatened, and so they plotted to discredit Zarathus. You see, my lord, who discovered all this? The man who cleans the house. It's as we thought, he's not a prophet. There's a sorcerer who wants your power and control. He's a wizard. 
who wants to rule the country in your place. What have you to say to these accusations? I do not know how these things came to be here. They're not mine, my lord. But they were found in your rooms. How can you say they're not yours? I did not put them there. You must believe me. He is not to be trusted, my lord. He only wants your wealth and power. He should be killed. I'll decide what happens to him. I give you this one last chance. Tell me the purpose of these objects. Are they for some ritual in your religion which you haven't told me of? They're not mine. I can only think they've been put here to discredit me in your eyes. Perhaps people are jealous of our friendship. Then they need no longer be. That friendship is now at an end. Deal with him, Jamaspa. I ask you, tell me truly, O oh Lord, who is truthful, who deceitful? Is this one evil or that one evil? How can I deliver deceit into the hands of truth in order to transform it in accordance with your teaching? How shall I make my voice powerful enough to lead mortal men to your eternal truth? Overwhelmed with anxieties concerning Zarathustra, the king spent long periods riding his beloved horse, Aspasia. Some days later, for no apparent reason, the king's horse became very ill. The monarch loved this animal, who no doubt became a symbol of adventure, a source of loyalty. The Queen and the Prime Minister, Jamaspa, stood by, unable to console the King in his misery. He's doing all he can. And it's not enough. There's no point in upsetting yourself, my lord. There's every point in upsetting myself. The best horse I ever owned is dying, and I'm sent a healer who is at death's door himself. The only doubt in my mind is who will expire first, the healer or the horse. I was told he's the most killed one we have, my lord. Perhaps he was, many years ago, before any of us were born. Bring him here. Get up, get up. Well. Well, can you not tell us what is wrong with him? He's very ill. Very, very ill. Out! Out! We must be patient. Bring me another healer. Bring it. me three. Say he will not last the night. They tried every remedy? Every one known to man. And a few new ones besides. Finish the food. Tell the king I can cure his horse. You? Yes. How do I know you will not kill him? What good would that do? Besides, I have a special cure. They have tried every cure. Not with the power of my god. You know. Do as I say. Tell him. I can well believe that he will cure him. Well, I can't. But it will only be further proof that he's a sorcerer. If he can't get out of prison, how can he cure a dying horse? Isn't it worth trying? Maybe. My lord. If I cure him, it won't be with sorcerer's magic, but through prayer and the power of my god. It will be a miracle, nonetheless. It will. One that I know he can perform. If you can perform such a miracle, if, then my queen is right. Yours is indeed a good and powerful god. He is. If you succeed, I shall take it as a sign. 
and I shall then accept your teaching. And I shall accept it also. And our son Isfandia shall help to spread your word throughout our lands. My lord, this is just more trickery. You must not trust this man. Why not? Did you want my horse to be cured? I forget what sort of man he is. But perhaps I've been misled. If he can do as he's promised, how can he be a sorcerer? How can saving life be the work of evil spirits? What his religion says is right. Only the destruction of life is evil. Life itself is good. I swear to you that if you do as you say, I will seek out and punish those men who have falsely accused you, whoever they may be. Yata ahu berio, ata ratush, ashat chitaja, vangeyush dadang anengo, shiauham. <laughs> the story of the black horse may or may not have happened exactly the way legend tells it, but the support the King Vishtasper gave was indeed the turning point for this new religion, Zoroastrianism. One has only to think of someone today coming to be President of the United States or the Queen of England and announcing that he was in fact a messenger of some newly discovered god armed with specific instructions on changing the entire nation's way of life to realize the impact Zarathustra's meeting with the king had. Over a period of years, King Vishtaspur traveled the entire country teaching and explaining the message of the new monotheistic religion. The king, traveling with his son, was successful in convincing his people. And so Zoroastrianism became firmly established throughout the land. Jamaspa, I am too old for this life. What will you do, my lord? I have led a full life. I have fought for our faith with all the energy that I possess. And now I have grown weary of the struggle. Isfandia can continue the good fight in my place. I wish to spend my last remaining years in quiet contemplation, cut off from the world and all its troubles. And how will you then be a good follower of the faith? Easily. I shall commit the rest of my life to the worship of Aura Mazda. I shall thank him daily, no, hourly, for the wisdom and happiness that he has brought me. What's the matter? Why do you frown? I thought you'd be pleased. I'm going to turn my back on worldly things and live a priestly life. So our priests do not turn their backs on the world. They are asked to marry and have children, to be part of the living world. You must show your devotion to Ahura Mazda by your good thoughts, good words, and good deeds in this world, not outside of it. Then I'll give away all my wealth so that I'll no longer be polluted by it, by material things. You seem to want to punish yourself. There is no need, my lord. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the things which one can have, so long as your wealth has not been dishonestly obtained. We live in such comfort. We are the most fortunate of men. Surely there must be something we can do for those less privileged than ourselves. One should follow the example of Ahura Mazda, who gave so generously when he created the world. Wealth is nothing to be ashamed of if it comes from hard work. Man must care for his family and give generously to those less fortunate than himself. And I have a gift for you, my lord. Not wealth, but worth everything to me. My niece, Habobi, if you would have her as your wife, it would be the greatest honor you could do to me. I cannot. Cannot? I see. Very well, my lord. No, it's not very well. He offers you the greatest gift in his possession, and you spurn it. Why can you not? Your priests are encouraged to marry. I cannot accept her, my lord, without seeing her face first. It's not in our custom to reveal a bride's face before her marriage. Indeed. No, it is not. Indeed, it is not. It is the custom now, my lord.
if we marry, we must marry as equals. You will be my partner, not my property. By the sacred act, we will become united in both the physical and the spiritual worlds. And we will work by our good thoughts to help each other acquire good minds and learn to be truthful one to the other. For truth is the greatest gift that husband and wife can give each other. Zarathustra married and had many children. And according to legend, he is believed to have been assassinated at the age of 77 by fanatics opposed to his teachings. The prophet left behind a legacy for all mankind. His principles of a democratic way of life are embodied to this day in governments the world over. One can see his ideas today at the United Nations in the King Cyrus Proclamation of Democracy. His historic treatment of women as equals was revolutionary then and even now. Perhaps Zarathustra's greatest gift to mankind was his striving for truth. But these facts, if they are facts, are not in the Gathas, nor are many of the episodes we've seen so far. No, they occur in the much later texts, some of them 2,000 years later. Nevertheless, there's a beautiful continuity of thought, of ideas, of content between the early and later works. So then is it true or not? Religious truth is of a different order from literal truth. Zoroastrianism offers a vision, not a description of the world, and its myths and rituals are the means by which this religious vision is made perfect. Zarathustra was the first to recognize the importance of an all-wise God, and that perception, that seed, has influenced the major religions of today, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of which believe in one God. But then tell me, why is it then that our religion is dying out? Is it because it's being carried forward by younger and stronger faiths? Or perhaps it's just outlived its natural life? No, you do not measure the truth of the religion merely by the number of its followers, but surely by the quality of its people All right, then show and me. the length of its survival. All right, then convince me of the relevance today for me to follow a religion of fire worshippers. We do not worship fire as a god, as you put it, any more than the Christians worship the cross as their god. In the Gathas, the Zoroastrian Psalms, fire becomes the light, the strength of truth, reaching up towards heaven. This light, like its creator, casts away the darkness. By revering the sacred fire, Zoroastrians remember to keep alive the strength of God which lives in all mankind. The symbol, this fire, kept burning in all Zoroastrian temples, must never go out as a sign of living faith that the darkness of evil, Angra Manu, can be repelled. Zoroastrian ritual, similarly, helps to bring insight, helps its followers refresh their spirits, helps find courage, and reminds them of the genuine joy of bringing harmony to the world. The creation of the world was set out in the Zoroastrian holy scriptures, the Bundahishan. God's plan was for a world that would last for 12,000 years. In the beginning, first 3,000 years, God created the perfect spiritual world. Then in the next 3,000 years, he created the sky, earth, plants, cattle, man, and fire. Then came Angra Manu in the shape of a serpent, bringing with him death and destruction, famine and vice. Zarathustra was brought to help man fight evil. In the final 3,000 years, 
the seeds sowed by Zarathustra in Lake Kosoya in Iran will magically bring forth three redeemers. When the last redeemer has completed his tasks, evil will be eliminated and the dead will be resurrected and reunited with their living souls. And then time as we now know it will cease to exist and the world will be perfect once more. A professor provided Zubin with his library's wealth of information about the ancient religion. Just as I'm beginning to see a relevance, a code to live by, I come up against a creation story that's a million miles from the rational thinking I've seen so far. Am I being unfair? What's this 9,000 years, for instance? If we are in the final 3,000 years, how long do we have to go? I don't think you should take that literally. Any more than most Jews or Christians now believe that the God of the Old Testament literally created the world in seven days. So am I to believe that it's another allegory, a battle between the good and the evil? You see, it shows the optimism of the religion. Because there is never any doubt that in the end, Angre Mainyu will be vanquished. Yes, I can see all that. But what worries me is that the story seems to come from a different mouth not from the man who saw his God as a friendly, accessible figure. But Zubin, our creation story was written down centuries later than the Gathas, in a work called the Bunda Hishin around the 6th century AD. Well, now, I've been told to study the Gathas. Now you talk about the Bunda Hishin. I mean, is it important? Well, what connection do they have? Let me explain. In the time of Zarathustra, 1700 BC, there was no written language in Iran. So the Gathas were memorized by his followers and then passed down by word of mouth to their children. And what is this language? Avestan. Avestan? It's a sister language to Sanskrit, the language of the earliest Hindu scriptures in India. As you've seen, the Vedic peoples of North India and the Zoroastrians came from the same stock, yes. which had split up some time before this. Now, in the centuries after Zarathustra, more hymns and religious works were composed by priests and sages. Now, collectively, these were known as the Younger Avesta. Now, the Gathas and most of the Younger Avesta existed before 500 BC. Mm -hmm. And they were brought together to form the main body of our religious writings, the Avesta. But the Avesta itself was written down much later, in about the 3rd century AD, in a Middle Iranian language called Palavi. Come, let's go outside and get some fresh air. Okay. Huh? Now, even though we believe that our religion is the oldest revealed religion in the world, at this point we are still being influenced by contemporary religions. But Zubin, you must remember that Iran was in the center of the ancient world. Yeah. Perfectly situated to influence and be influenced. And when it was at its most powerful, this influence radiated outwards throughout the ancient world, affecting not only Judaism and Christianity and later Islam, but in the Achaemenian dynasty in the 4th century BC, influencing even the thinking of the great philosopher Plato. Now, come on, that's hard to believe. How could you possibly substantiate that? I'll show you. Come with me. Would you like a cup of tea? No, no, this is getting too interesting now. Plato certainly knew of Zoroastrianism, he mentions Zarathustra in his writings. As a matter of fact, there is even a fresco by Raphael in the Vatican entitled The School for Athens, mm. depicting Zarathustra with Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. And what do they have in common? I'm glad you asked. At the beginning of time, Aura Mazda created a perfect world, similar to the ideal world in Plato. But both Platonism and Zoroastrianism agree that the world we live in is not perfect. So Plato concludes from this that it is not the real world and that the only way to understand the real world is by understanding the ideas behind it. Or, in Zoroastrian terms, by understanding the truth, or Asha. Now, to reach such an understanding, Plato says we must use Nos, the intuitive mind, exactly paralleled in Zoroastrianism by Bohumana, the good mind. Now, by following this path, Plato says we will overcome the corruption of the material world, or in Zoroastrian terms, the corruption caused by Angre Manio. And in the end, the world will be perfect once again. That's extraordinary. But why did we exert such an influence in the Achaemenian times? Why were we so great? 
Cyrus the Great. The house of God, which is in Jerusalem, let the house be rebuilt that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed. the gold and silver utensils of the house of God that Nebuchadnezzar stole and brought to Babylon. Let them be restored and put back in the temple which is at Jerusalem. And you shall put them in the house of God yourselves. Just wait till I meet my Israeli friends the next time. So the Jewish people owe so much to the Zoroastrians because via Cyrus and Darius, we actually paid for the rebuilding of their second temple. That's right. So now I can ask them the next time I'm back in Jerusalem to help us out. <laughs> Why not? Cyrus's love was an enduring one. And so the Jews considered him the anointed one. The anointed one? You mean to say that the Jews took Cyrus for their Messiah? He must have seemed like that to many of them. Here in Isaiah 44, they talk of him as the Messiah. So it's not surprising that they were greatly influenced by the faith of such a king. But then this was the first real contact between Judaism and Zoroastrianism. The two faiths already shared certain basic beliefs in monotheism, the essential goodness mm -hmm. of the world. But now the Jews took on the Zoroastrian belief in the resurrection and immortality of man and in the final judgment. We see this again in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45. And these beliefs then filtered through Judaism into Christianity. Centuries later, yes. What happened after the conquest of Babylon? Cyrus was now head of the greatest empire then known to man. But only seven years later, in 529 BC, he was killed, fighting a tribe of nomads. The first and most generous king of the Persian Empire was buried at his palace near Pasargadi. And on his tomb was the simple inscription, here I lie, Cyrus, King of Kings. These are the ruins of the great palace of Persepolis. The palace was begun by King Darius I, who reigned from 521 BC for nearly 40 years, which was about the same time that Buddha was spreading his message throughout northern India. It was a showplace, a celebration of immense power and wealth. Its massive size was meant to impress the people. In fact, it was the largest palace built in the world's history. The audience hall held 10,000 people. The throne hall was even larger. This palace wasn't just a building. It was an extension of the great empire that Cyrus had created and his son Xerxes continued. Darius believed he had a divine mandate to rule the world. He was a superb administrator and lawmaker. His emphasis on justice is a Zoroastrian trait. Later kings spent their lives enjoying the great wealth Darius and Xerxes had built. Their preoccupation with luxury living started to disintegrate when, in 333 BC, Darius III met Alexander the Great at Isis. Our enemies are Medes and Persians. Men over centuries have lived soft and luxurious lives. We men of Macedonia and Greece have been trained in the hard school of war and vigilance. But above all, we are free! Alexander was determined to get his revenge, as did Xerxes when he defeated the Greeks by burning the city-state of Athens. And so the centuries of hatred between the Persians and the Greeks continued. Finally, around 330 BC, Alexander came here to Persepolis and conquered it too. Oh, 
every single one of them. On my visit to Persepolis, I heard many reasons for its destruction. Alexander was determined to leave his stamp on the downfall of the Achaemenian Empire. Legend claims that during a drunken orgy, the young conqueror ordered his general Parmenio to destroy the palace. When, however, Parmenio hesitated, he forced his courtesan Thias to select the method by which the palace would be destroyed. It was a night Alexander regretted for the rest of his life. What is a fitting punishment for these pagans who dared fight against Alexander? I wish the slain and my tarp to decide the fate of my enemies destroyed our Acropolis. Let Parmenia have his men chop them down. To think of something more interesting for those who burned our city state. Never be known as Alexander the Great now. After what you've done, you'll be known as Alexander the Accursed. Alexander the Accursed. destroyed the living words of our faith. But our religious texts, they were safe, weren't they? No, they were in the minds of our priests. When the Greeks murdered our priests, which they did by the thousands so that they could loot our temples, they destroyed the living books of our faith. After a few centuries, in 224 AD, the Parthians were overthrown by the ambitious young king Ardesha from Persia. He conquered both the west and east of Iran. He was determined to create a new, centralized, highly nationalistic Persian Empire, in which he would be the new Darius. And to achieve these goals, he used violence and the force of the religion itself through his chief priest, Herbard Panza. King of Tabristan of northern Iraq. I am required to send greetings by King Adisha, King of Kings. Very kind. A social visit, I assume. He has asked me to give you this. Tell me what further revelations it contains. Are we to suffer still more bloodshed in the name of our religion? The people themselves are to blame for any punishment and slaughter. For it has only occurred where they have become wicked and forgotten the truths of God's teaching. Or where they have continued to deny the truth of King Ardashir's innovations. They are not innovations. He has restored the religion to its ancient state from which it had decayed since the destruction wrought by Alexander. 
He has brought the religion together once more, where in Parthian times it was fragmented and dispersed. But has he created happiness and harmony amongst the faithful by his acts? I think not. Oh, have no fear. We will create harmony. We? In days to come, the foundation of state and religion will in every way be strengthened by our actions. If in the process, more bloodshed is required, heaven forbid. But if it should be, even of a prodigality that seems to know no bounds, then so be it. It is for the future life and health of our country. And like the rain, which quickens the earth, we shall not flinch from it. I think you will enjoy every minute of it. Is this a man of God speaking, or is it one of King Ardashir's lackeys? I would advise you... Advise me nothing! Give it back to him. You would do well to read this. And if I do not? Then he will conquer your kingdom like he has the rest of Iran, and you will be forced to read it. He has not succeeded so far. He has failed once. But he will not fail again. He has the strength of God behind him. So have I. You do not. We have the same God behind us. Which do you think he will choose? The peaceable king? <laughs> or the despot who exploits his name to rule by fear and violence? He is no despot. You will regret saying such things. You do not share his God. As chief priest of the Church of Zarathustra, I tell you, you do not worship the same God unless you accept that there is but one God. Oh, I accept that. And there is but one king who represents him on earth. And that is Adashar, worthy successor to Vistashpad and Darius the Great. So for the last 550 years, the whole of Iran has been godless. Is that correct? Because each province had its own king who worshipped at his own royal fire. They will be forgiven their mistakes if they accept the truth now. And this one king, is he to be the sole spokesman on earth for the true word of God? He has many duties. You must read what he has to say. Is there something in it that will shock me? Hmm? Surely not. After all you have said. <laughs> you are spiritual leader. I bring with me the power to remove your royal power. And if you resist, I will send troops that will raise your temple to the ground. Will there to be no more sacred fires? Is that your great plan? On the contrary, we shall establish more sacred fires, but there will only be one royal fire, the fire of King Adesha himself. And there will be no more worship of cult gods in their statues. For they too are a blasphemy against the truth and purity of Ahura Mazda. But that is impossible. The Greeks and the Romans have their statues. The Buddhists have them. Even the Jews and the Christians have them. They will be torn down. All statues and images are against the true spirit of the one religion, and they will be destroyed, even the statues of your ancestors. We have always allowed other faiths to worship as they wished. It is one of the great strengths of our religion. Yes. But our excessive tolerance has weakened and endangered our faith. So much so that we have been in danger of being overpowered by the ideas of the other religions. But the danger should no longer exist, because henceforth, we shall permit our people to worship no other god but Ahara Mazda and practice the original faith of Zarathustra. You cannot do this. The practices of the religion have been established. Therefore, they must be maintained in the orthodox form throughout the realm. You dare not. Dare not. 
Fortunately, we have once more a brave and strong king who sees that there is but one god and is not afraid to worship him with all the strength of his command. Terrified by pressures from rival religions, the Zoroastrian church grew more and more hostile and intolerant. Some priests became corrupt and acquired power and wealth by demanding payments from the people through complex rituals. On the other hand, some great traditions were formed by other priests which are still observed to this day. These times engendered a genuine renaissance in various artistic disciplines. Fine jewellery and silk work was crafted. Styles of architecture developed. Rock relief sculpting emerged. Literature appeared. It was a time of stunning testimonies to the exceptional inherent talents and traditions Zoroastrians are capable of, and which in fact form the basis of many of the world's contemporary customs and practices. The striking similarities one finds in Christianity and Judaism in modern life emanated from ancient Zoroastrian traditions. How did it benefit us? For one thing, various parts of the Avesta during this period were gathered together and were translated into Pallavi, the language of the people. And that began sometime around the 3rd century AD. By that time, the Vandizad, our equivalent to the Book of Leviticus in the Bible, had already been compiled. And what is contained in the Vandizad? Nay, nay, Jamna, Sivachwan, from right to left, from okay. right to left. Yeah, it's one of the first books that deals with the laws and our social customs of our religion. It concerns the laws of purity and purification, but deals with the problems of pollution, disease and death. <laughs> I've always been convinced, it's a feeling I have, that I will die in India. And if that is so, I will go through this ceremony. I believe I have a soul. The dead are devoured by vultures, thereby recycling and purifying the remains. The Towers of Silence are scientifically designed with limestone pits which serve to filter the remains so they can't pollute the earth. And so, the flesh becomes the earth, the breath becomes the wind, the bones become stones. Don't we bury them or burn them instead of feeding them to the vultures? Is it better to let the bodies be eaten by worms or to leave them to be roasted? We believe that by burying the body, we are polluting the earth. And by burning them, we are committing an even greater sin by desecrating the fire. In other words, if we were to bury them at sea, we'd be polluting the water then? Yes. Did this practical side, the emphasis on involvement with this world rather than the next, did it add fuel to our conflict with the Christians? Because they firmly believed and they had their eyes on the next world, isn't it? That's right. And in the Holy Roman Empire, Christianity became the enemy of our religion. Then an even greater threat sprang up. The Prophet Mohammed was born 570 years after the death of Christ. At the time of his death, his armies were spreading Islamic gospel far beyond Arabia. Their conquests were rapid and savage. But these Arabs were fighting a religious crusade. First Babylon fell, then Damascus, then Syria and Palestine, North Africa, and then Nahavan. The Muslims' brilliant victory at Nahavan changed the course of history. Under early Arab rule, those refusing to convert to Islam were heavily taxed. Even those who paid were often tortured and killed. The Holocaust continued.
Will you convert now? No! Oh. Throw the coffin out. <laughs> now, where is your money? I have brought no money. Have you come to tell me that you will throw away your custody and submit to the will of our God? No. My Lord. Then why are you here? I was brought here because I persuaded one of your converts to return to the true faith. I see. You know, it is against our law to do what you have done. You know what we do to those who break our laws. But why? When there are so many similarities between our two religions. We too pray five times a day. We too believe in heaven and hell. You blaspheme against our faith by comparing it with yours. But what do you have against us? We even believe in one God as you do. But not the same God. Then are the gods of the Jews and the Christians the same as your gods? Why do you accept their prophets, Moses and Jesus? If you can accept them, then why not accept us? You even accept their sacred books. Because you are not people of the book. Your religion has no book. We have our sacred works like you do. You call them sacred. They are sacred to us. And they are older, much older than yours. They are nothing. How can we take seriously the works that for centuries have not been written down, but were kept in the minds of your priests? Because much of what they preserved is the voice of our prophet himself, his very own words, unlike the book of the Christians, which contains not the words of Christ himself, but only the words of his disciples and followers. So how can you tell me that their book is more sacred than ours? I need not tell you anything. You are the one who needs to convince me, and you have failed to do so with all your preposterous arguments. The only reason I have failed is because you refuse to listen. You dare to say that? All right, I will listen. But first answer me this. You call your religion great, a religion that believes in renunciation, self-denying, and celibacy. My religion demands no such thing. That is one of the heresies that crept in at a later stage. Our religion is opposed to all pessimistic beliefs. Indeed. Your wealthy Sassanians were great exploiters. Their priests made life unbearable for the suffering poor. Just as you do. And yet, they were able to promote learning and to create great works of art, literature, and music. And don't forget, like you, they fought against the worship of images and idols. That's enough. I will have no more of this. When you run out of answers, then you demand blind obedience. You want all men to be powerless before you. My religion teaches me that a man has the freedom to think and then to believe. Take him away. Let him pay for what he has done. Where does your prophet say that my people must be killed? It was after the ninth century, when all reasoning failed, that some of the Zoroastrians set sail to find a new homeland. Their destination was India, to a part that had escaped the Muslim invasion. The long sea voyage finally ended as they landed on the island of Gyu, off the west coast of India.
what do you want here? We seek sanctuary and the right to light our sacred fire here and practice our religion in your land. Bring me the holy box. I'd like to show you something. No, no, no. These are our sacred ashes, which we brought from Iran. When my forefathers asked for a homeland in India, I wonder if they were reminded of the Hindu scriptures which state, to do good to others is not to give them physical comforts or to raise their standard of living. It is to help others to find their true nature, to attain true happiness. You're welcome to rest here, of course, for as long as you wish. And every hospitality we can offer you is yours. Well, perhaps not everything. You're very grateful. Your Majesty. Well, after you have recovered and refreshed from your journey, I'm sure you will be longing to get on to your destination. What is it? I think, Your Majesty, what he means is they were hoping to be able to stay here. What? Stay? Permanently? Yes, Your Majesty. Ah, well, uh, uh, you see, Dew is a very small kingdom, a very small island indeed. And considering our population, uh, yours is a very extraordinary request. I must have time to take it over soon. You say you wish to settle down in our land permanently. Uh, bring me a bowl and some milk. Fill it up to the brim. Now you see, our little land is like this bowl full of milk. One more drop and it will overflow. May I have that bowl of sugar? As you can see, the milk dissolves the sugar. So? The milk has not overflowed. The sugar has been absorbed. I see. Most impressive. <laughs> now, yes? If you would let me finish, my lord. The milk has been enriched and sweetened by the sugar. We will be absorbed into your country, sweetening and nourishing it without straining your resources. A most persuasive argument, certainly. What do you think? Perhaps if you made certain conditions, my lord, to safeguard our people. The ruler, Jada Brana, set five conditions that these new immigrants would have to meet if they hoped to make India their new home. First, they had to give a full explanation of their religion. Secondly, they would have to hold all religious ceremonies after dark so that they wouldn't in any way influence the Hindus. They would learn the new language, Gujarati, and in order to make assimilation more visible, the women would wear the traditional Indian garments. Because these immigrants came from Pars and spoke ancient Persian, Farsi, they became known as Parsis. The king then gave his final condition. And finally, I would want your people to lay down their arms and never raise them against us in anger. Then welcome to our country. Thank you, Your Majesty. The king has agreed. We have a home of our own. 
Dio, my ancestors went to Sanjan on the west coast of India where they settled for centuries. Then they moved to Bombay where their rise to power and profits began with the coming of the British Raj. Once the British took over control of India, the Parsi people began to lose their identity. The British often installed themselves by sending missionaries to convert the entire Indian population. One such missionary, who had enormous effect, was John Wilson. Sir, do you know what your prayers mean in that strange language you say them in? No, sir, but we have learned all our prayers by heart through our oral tradition. Tradition is a wonderful thing. No one stands behind it as we British do, but you should at least know why it's there. I have a work here, one of your holy books. It is called the Bundahissan. You have heard how the Christian Gospels deal with the question of good and evil. Now I will describe to you how it is dealt with in one of your own religious works. Evil arrived in this world, we read, in the shape of a snake, which burst through the skies, followed by a mob of fellow demons. Whether they were in the shape of smaller snakes, or perhaps worms, is not mentioned. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I implore you, Reject this ridiculous book of yours. Oh, yes. And the many others you have. Take instead our beautiful Bible. We deal with real situations, real people. Moses, Abraham, the great kings David and Solomon, and our beloved Lord Jesus. Yes! Yeah. And what about your book of Genesis? And what about your nonsense about snakes and apples? And that Adam living for 930 years? Bloody humbug! Sit down, better ya! What right? We haven't come to listen to you. Better ya, Kalipri Katkat Kayakaroj. We know your authority on absolutely nothing. Better ya! Ladies, ladies, please don't misunderstand me. Since arriving in your country, I've been deeply impressed by the devout and upright character of the Parsi community. They have quite justifiably earned the deepest respect both of the British and Indians in Bombay. Small though your community is, it has become a major influence in India today. Now you're talking some sense! So I wonder that such a forward-thinking, intelligent people should really follow a religion that believes that snakes can come through the sky as if the sky were a wrapping around the world that can be penetrated and torn at any point. Now, such a religion has anything valid to say to our society today? Yes, sir. We have a great deal to offer to the world today. If our people would sit and read the Gatha, which has the translation in English and Gujarati, they learn the message of our prophet. Maybe, maybe. Could be so. Who has the time to read all that, eh? Look at all the wonderful stories the Bible tells. Love stories. Oh. <laughs> You're so grand, eh? Johnny, my dear, you have to tell me the meaning of your prayer, Ashimbo. Johnny, my Johnny, don't be so chicky, monkey. Why are you calling me a monkey? Why are you so much? I'm more wondering what I'm saying. Do you know that in some parts of Google, Parsi men still have more than one wife, and you're all over this pagan practice? You're quite right, Reverend Wilson. Like most religions, Zoroastrianism is one with many different interpretations. It reminds me of the differences in orchestras. In Europe and America, the orchestras get their instructions and that's it. In Israel, instructions are given and then discussions and arguments commence. As I get this, as I get this niche, even before a note is played. We Parsis are like that. We are a very argumentative lot. When a Parsi looks himself in the mirror, even then he begins to argue. But surely you can't take these arguments seriously. Oh yes, they had their effects. They bred skepticism. More so when the priests themselves didn't have ready answers. In the eyes of the wealthy laity, the priests were exposed as out of touch, as ignorant of their own literature. And skepticism then led to scorn. 
and while some lay Parsis were making great wealth during British times, the priests became undereducated, underpaid, and were ever less able to rekindle the fire within the hearts of the faithful, a real tragedy. And even today, Zubin, the average full-time priest earns no more than rupees 600 or 60 dollars per month. And on this income, he's expected to bring up a family. It was a Parsi, in fact, who started the airline, which was India's first international commercial ambassador. He was the young J.R.D. Tata, now head of this great dynasty. Parsi, charity is thy name, is a saying that owes much to people like Sir Jamsheji Jijibu, a self-made millionaire before the age of 30. The more money he made, the more he gave away. For his great services, Queen Victoria made him a baron, and the title is carried on to this day. He was, without question, in the history of the world, the greatest individual philanthropist. Since he was giving from his private purse, and was not affiliated with corporations or tax shelters. The highest military rank ever given to an Indian, Field Marshal, was earned by a graduate of India's West Point, the National Defense Academy, Sam Banekshaw. A hero in World War II, he won the nickname Sam Badur, which means Brave Sam. Parsis have been great successes in the arts, especially in the cinema. The pioneer of India's talking films was Adeshia Irani, a Zoroastrian. But the Cecil B. De Mill of the Indian screen was Saurabh Modi, who was famous as an epic maker. His most notable was Sikanda, Alexander the Great. Another filmmaker famous for escapist and high adventure films was Homi Wadya and his Russian wife, Nadia. Their films were certainly the forerunners of Raiders of the Lost Ark. After the use of the atom bomb on Hiroshima, a young Indian, Homi Baba, thought to himself that if so much destruction can be caused by this energy, then how much construction could be achieved? He was a man of immense vision, as his paintings portray, not only in the field of art, but for the use of nuclear energy in peaceful purposes. With the help of Prime Minister Nehru and the Tatas, India's first nuclear plant at Trombe was set up. When one thinks of great Parsis, one thinks of Nafsari's favorite son who was born here, Jamsheji Tata, who was a genius of industry as well as charity. Accumulating wealth from selling armaments, his industrial empire included iron and steel mills, which have grown into the cities of Jamshedpur and Tata Naga, employing over half a million people. His many innovations included hydroelectricity, building programs, hotels, science research, welfare, medical benefits, daycare clinics, and profit share. The Tata Empire today is a vast conglomerate of companies involved with transportation, chemicals, cosmetics, and it goes on and on. In fact, one might feel that Tata is almost synonymous with India, and India with Tata. Dr. Dada Boy Nabroji was born in this house in Napsari. A scholar and spokesman for the independence of India, in 1893, he won a seat in Gladstone's Liberal Party in England. There were only three Indians who have ever been members of the British Parliament. All three were Parsees. The first was Dr. Navroji, who was affectionately called the Grand Old Man of India. No, sorry. I've waited all my life for this moment to see and worship at the temple of my forefathers. I'm going to introduce you to two of our most senior priests, Dastur Merji Rana and Dastur Kotwal. Dastur Rana comes from that great line that started in the 16th century. Welcome to Nausari. This is one of the great art temples of India. Isn't it you I can't believe I'm here. In my life, I have felt that there is some powerful force guiding me. I feel there must be something that has made order around me. Can this not be God? Oh, 
I just can't believe it. I'm so moved by this. Really, only from sentimental point of view, of course. Because my grandfather only talked about Nausari. You know, he lived all his life in Bombay, but this was his route. And all our family, going back about 600 years or so, Can you show me the town? Yes, come on. Huh? Turkey. Now, sorry, Jenny, join It's a sentimental journey to my family's town and our home. But I wish I was alone rather than with all these people being treated as a celebrity. But I want to come on. Yes, sorry, sir. How are you? Hello, 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 hello. We have found a book of family history of my past family. Oh, that's uh, unbelievable. Uh, 11 generations of here. Yes. You are here, and it is on the 11th generation in the line of late Baiji Mehta. Baiji? Late Baiji. Ah. Your so father, Baba uh, I appreciate I'm Baba Baba I know Baba Baba Let me go inside now. Ah, Baba 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 Well, I'm dazed. <laughs> I wish I knew which room my grandfather was born. This is wonderful. And that you found the book? Yeah, here. It is lying here even today. Yeah, they're not duty. This is with me, but I have just found out under that copy. No, really? Yeah, really, really. It, it is in the same condition. They didn't destroy it. Yeah. So maybe I can buy it from yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. No, you can have it. Pick it up. Huh? It is. It is. Uh, some, That's wonderful. You, you can, it's you the can same book. This. Yeah, same book. You can take this. That's wonderful. Here on tableland in my beloved India, I have the same feeling I had when I was flying in a plastic bubble, the nose of a transport plane with nothing under me but the grandeur of the Himalayas. In total awe of nature and God, as when I am confronted with Beethoven's Eroica, where he glorifies the quest of mankind for victory over the forces of evil. I feel the same exultation this morning, the final day of my journey. On the other hand, isn't it tragic that we are just sitting here and letting the faith die away? We shall not let it die. The time has come for all of us to turn our good thoughts, our good words, our good deeds back to the religion itself. And will you succeed? Oh, yes. We shall not let it die. Because our master is eternal and guards the truth and the good mind for eternity. Take this, my prayer book. The words of our religion. It may help you in your work and in your life. Bless you. Thank you. May God be with you. Remember, we must not be afraid to grow in spirit, in strength, in wisdom. And in that way, our religion will grow and flourish. For some people, the top of the world means the birth of their first child. For an explorer, it might mean the discovery of a new land. For a musician, beauty and harmony transcend reality and heaven and earth become one. Then our breath becomes the wind, our tears become the rain, our inspiration becomes the music we celebrate for an eternal second, the majesty of our universe.